Hello, everybody. Welcome to our virtual visit. We are very happy to connect with Mexico. I will be your guide up. So I will be in the surface while my young and active colleague will be running up and down explaining what you could visit. Actually, sometimes virtual visits are even better because you can see things that we are not allowed to show to normal public. So it's very good that you are here. So she will be running up and down and show you everything that you could visit now in CMS and even more. So this is Isabel and she is an experimental high energy physicist like me. She will tell you about herself a little bit, I think. Hello. Um, so yes, I'm an experimental physicist. I work a lot on the, the detector actually. So I do supervise students and work on data analysis, but most of the time I'm working in the muon group. So that's part of the CMS detector. It's a part of the detector that is specifically made to detect uh, muons. Yes. Can, can I ask perhaps to, to pause for a bit when you say something so we can have some, also some time to translate perhaps? Ah, okay. <laughs> Está diciendo ella que es una física de partículas. Ella trabaja ya en los análisis y que ahorita nos va a dar la, la, la explicación. Please go ahead, yes. sorry. Yes, that's fine. Now I can hear you also. Um, so yeah, mostly I work on the muon detector, which is part of the CMS detector and is made to detect muon specifically, which is a type of uh, particle. Uh, so I work on the upgrade of the detector and also on running part of it. Ella trabaja con un detector de muones. Eh, trabaja para la actualización de uno de los detectores que ellos nos van a, a enseñar ellos. Ok. And I'm Andromachi. I'm also an experimental physicist, only 30 years older than Isabel. <laughs> I have always been working on detectors. And my work is mostly on the central part of the detector where silicon rules, silicon detectors rule. I work mostly with control systems because you can say that I am practically an electronics electrical engineer. You work a lot with uh, these. There are very vague limits between applied physicists in uh, big detectors and uh, engineers. You have ella, to translate ella, this to your students. Ella es Andromachi, es una experta, es lo que llamamos senior en el experimento. Ya tiene bastantes años trabajando en la parte de detectores. Trabaja para otro detector que está en el centro de, 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 del CMS, del experimento en total, y tiene pues, mucha experiencia ¿no? trabajando con electrónica, con, otro, con muchos elementos. ¿no? Adelante. Eh, yeah, go, go ahead. And I want uh, to just to, to talk also to the young students, to your students that want to go into engineering. The physicists certainly will always be there. Okay. So I welcome you. Ella va a hablar un poco más por la parte de la ingeniería, ¿no? O sea, los físicos, pues es la mayor parte del experimento, pero ahora también por la gente que quiera hacer ingeniería también. Because you have to know, and probably do, that in big labs, big labs of high energy physics like CERN, there is practically no discipline that is not being represented. We have very many computer scientists, very many engineers, very many physicists, and uh, practically we run by collaborating with uh, five or six times more people than what we are at CERN. Sí, lo que, lo que les comentaba, que en este tipo de experimentos hay de todo tipo de gente, físicos, ingenieros, técnicos, matemáticos, eh, ciencias de la computación, todos trabajando en conjunto. Ok. Okay, so I will be going downstairs soon uh, and I will show you uh, a lot of um, things we have in the service cavern downstairs. So we have electronics, computers. Unfortunately, we will not go to the experiment itself of which you can see a picture behind me um, because right now uh, the accelerator is on so we cannot enter, but uh, I can show you all the rest. Bueno, ella, Isabel, nos va a hacer favor de ir hacia abajo. Ahorita está en la superficie, pero todas las instalaciones tienen, están 100 metros hacia abajo. No, creo que no vamos a, no van a poder estar, entrar a la caverna en sí en general, pero nos vamos a ver todos los elementos que existen y vamos a ver la representación aquí a través del, del experimento. Básicamente una recreación de, de, lo que está, de, de lo que está compuesto el experimento. Adelante. 
Okay. So now Hoa Elizabeth is going to be struggling to go down. I want to center with you on two things. First of all, you all know more or less what is LHC, that it's the largest mas machine ever built, that it goes, it's a huge underground donut, 26 kilometers big, that goes under the Jura Mountains and it almost reaches the Lake Geneva. And inside this big uh, underground donut, you have four huge bubbles in which we have one detector. The detector is nothing more than a huge camera which is taking pictures at speeds, uh, we, at huge speeds because we are discussing events in the order of nanoseconds. Eh? So we take enormous, uh, enormously fast pictures. And uh, from these pictures, after we put everything together, the physicists can uh, decide whether theories about which explain how matter came together, how it was created starting from the Big Bang are valid or not, because there are several theories, there are several open questions, and we use these pictures to verify. So you can say the detector is like a huge tomograph working in a huge hospital where it can do absolutely any type of, uh, of, of picture. It can take any type of picture. Then it depends on the particular medical facility what you are going to examine. So all these pictures are being distributed all over our uh, physics colleagues and each one studies them from another optic. Yes, I let you translate. Okay. Eh, sí, básicamente tenemos el acelerador, el gran túnel de, de 27 kilómetros de circunferencia localizado bajo tierra, una profundidad de entre 50 y 100 tantos metros. Por eso hay que bajar en un elevador hacia, hacia, hacia estos dispositivos. Tenemos distribuido sobre, las, sobre el túnel cuatro experimentos principales. Hay otros secundarios, pero cada uno de ellos nos ayuda a a tomar una imagen de lo que está ocurriendo en el momento. Y los físicos, a partir de esas imágenes, de esos datos, son capaces de corroborar las teorías, incluso como les comentaba, las teorías del Big Bang, de cómo evolucionó el universo, por medio de las interacciones, y corroborando con los datos todo lo que la teoría nos dice, ¿no? comprobando si los datos tienen coherencia con lo que la teoría dice. Y... Y básicamente es eh, eh, desafiando, digamos, las leyes de, de, de la física de las teorías. Si podemos, si podemos ver, ya está, ya está moviéndose. Este es, son las instalaciones del experimento CMS. Nosotros le llamamos el punto 5.5. Si, si pueden ver, ahí va a estar eh, justamente entrando. De hecho, cuando entra uno a esa puerta, se encuentra el cuarto de control, es decir, las computadoras donde uno maneja los detectores que se encuentran bajo tierra. Ahí está. Eh, Isabel está yendo a ese lugar. Eh, Andrew Mackey, you want to yes. say something else? Uh, no, you are seeing them going down, actually. You saw all the controls. And again, I repeat that here we are having four detectors. You are seeing one of the two major, the two major, the two more general detectors of LHC made to answer to almost all problems we can study. Given that I cannot, and Isabella, we cannot show you the real detector, I think it would be great if we could see the real detector because here at CMS, where we are, we have a one-to-one -one picture, which really can give you, can we do that, uh, Zoltan? Can we show them the picture of the detector? Uh, are they seeing? I see, I see the, the accelerator. I don't see the detector. Okay, so I would like where I am, I would like to turn so you can see the detector, which is at 100 meters underground. Yes, I think we, 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 we're seeing the, the You are seeing the detector. Excellent. Yes. So you see, this is what you would see if you were lucky enough. It's exactly the correct size and you would be sitting on the balconies as visitors. The balconies... This is a representation of the size of the detector. You can see the people behind. 
actually it's very good because you can see the people next to it and you will see that the detector consists of very defined pieces each of which does a certain job so you have the very center now we see a perpendicular uh, we see a cut it's you can imagine it like a huge salami and i have cut it in half so you can see the very center where uh, the where the beam would be uh, can, ah, yes, no, so, so, sorry, 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 I don't want to kill anybody with my laser. Uh, so in the very, very center where the, where the yellow part is, is where the, beam go, the beams meet. All around this, the yellow part is the tracker, the detector that uh, uses silicon technology in order to uh, define where the charged par uh, particles have, that have been created during the collisions are going. Maybe you translate. Ok, sí, ese es el detector CMS. La imagen que están viendo allá, el detector tiene una forma cilíndrica eh, y tiene varias capas. La parte central, lo que vemos, digamos, si tenemos un corte transversal, es la otra imagen, la que tenemos allá. Y en el centro es donde vienen los haces y colisionan. Se forman las partículas, vuelan muchas partículas, Y el detector está diseñado por capas. Cada Can capa tiene una función en particular. Uh, no, Tell them that this is the beam line. Okay. So, very yes. good. So you saw the detector, the detector, and then all around it is the part of the detector that is measuring the energy. That's why it's called calorimetry. Calorimeter. It, it, it is actually a Spanish word. Eh? It's calor. So the calorimeter yeah. is the blue part that you see that measures the energy. All this big part is inside this silver circle. Mm -hmm. Can I use the laser now? Can I use the laser now? Uh, let's see. Ah, okay. Yes, I can use the laser now. Very good. So now you can see. So this is, this is the tracker and this blue thing is the calorimeter. All around is the silver thing is nothing but a thermos. It's actually containing the windings of our magnet, which have to be kept at minus 270 something degrees because we use uh, superconductivity in order to be able to pass the huge currents that are needed to make us, to enable us have a magnet that is a hundred thousand times the Earth's field. Time to. You can translate. Yeah, es, básicamente tenemos, como les comentaba, diferentes capas de materiales, cada una con un objetivo particular de detección de partículas. Los calorímetros son partículas que son detectores que están diseñados para recolectar energía de electrones y fotones, de aquellos que sienten la, la, la fuerza electromagnética. Después tenemos un campo magnético que se genera, por eso es el, por eso es el nombre de solenoide. Tenemos un elemento solenoide que genera un campo magnético y ese campo magnético va a ayudar a que detectemos las partículas llamadas muones, ya que son las partículas que por medio de ese campo magnético se deflectan y por esa deflexión básicamente curvan su trayectoria y gracias a ese fenómeno podemos conocer, por ejemplo, el momento de esas partículas. ¿no? Entonces, todo este, todo, cada una de estas capas está diseñada para detectar cierto tipo de, de partícula elemental. Algunas de ellas dejan, depositan su energía. Algunas partículas son menos, interactúan menos con la materia, entonces son capaces de viajar un poco más y por eso está diseñado cada, cada capa de este detector. Ok. Go and to, to close the story very fast, all particles are going to die inside the calorimeter because they interact with the heavy materials and they spit out, they give all their energy in the form of electromagnetic showers. If you measure, if you monitor the number, the energy that gets emitted in the form of photons or electricity, electrical signal, then you know the energy of the particle. Except one particle whose presence is very much studied and it's very, very important for high energy physics, which is called the muon. The muon is in principle one fat electron. Huh? And this muon 
has the ability to go to interact with matter, but extremely slightly. So you know it's there, but you know you are never going to catch it. That's why you are putting all around the detector, given that everything will die in here and only the muons will survive, you put chambers that are going to detect exactly the same way like the tracker detects the first charged, the charged particles that are produced in the center of the interaction. The muon detectors are catching whatever goes out. And then you have, if you put everything together and we have great computing guys that put, put everything together, you have the picture of the event. That's it. Okay. La mayoría de las partículas van a depositar su energía y morir en, el, en los calorímetros. Básicamente lo que explicaba la región de los calorímetros, excepto por los mones. Los mones son partículas que interaccionan débilmente con la materia. Ellos van a volar, van a tener un tra una trayectoria más larga, un tiempo de vida mayor, y es por eso que se colocan en la capa exterior, en la última capa, detectores especiales para este tipo de partículas. ¿Ok? Hi. Hello. Yeah. Hello. So yeah. on my way downstairs, I am now in the control room first. So you can see here, there's two parts. On this part, you see a lot of detector experts. So these are people who are expert on the different parts Maki just talked about. So the tracking detector in the middle, the calorimeters, immune detectors. And uh, they can watch here on their screens. Um, the health of the detector and uh, they can also control it and then we have the other part a bit further in the control room where we have shifts actually 24 7 so these people are always here and making sure that cms is running fine and that there is uh, good data you can also see some drawings event displays in the corner showing events we see right now um, from the LHC. Oh, yeah, we can go closer. <laughs> so we have yeah, a lot of shifters today. Oh, ah, yeah, I translate first, maybe. Yeah. Yes. Eh, Isabel, ahora está. Isabel está en el cuarto de control. Es ese cuarto cuarto de control del experimento CMS. Está dividido por módulos. Ustedes pueden ver todas las pantallas, eh, las, los, los sistemas y cada parte del detector CMS, cada capa de ese de ese detector tiene un sistema de control. Por ejemplo, el sistema de, de detección de muones o los detectores de muones tienen su propio sistema de monitoreo de los datos. Es decir, cuando, está, cuando el experimento está trabajando, ya nadie está dentro del aparato. ¿no? Todo se controla por, por fuera, desde el cuarto de control, que es donde está en este momento Isabel. Y los físicos, los mm. técnicos, son capaces de por medio de estas visualizaciones en tiempo real pueden decir cómo está funcionando el detector, está recabando los datos correctamente o puede que se vean algunas eh, cosas raras y ahí es cuando tienen que comunicar con los expertos para saber qué acción deben tomarse. ¿no? Obviamente se espera que todo funcione correctamente, pero como cualquier experimento siempre pueden haber fallos, ¿no? pero ellos pueden monitorear todo esto desde el cuarto de control. Ok, son Okay, so on our way down, we say hello to the shift leader <laughs> and we let them know we're going down for a visit. <laughs> Ella es el, se llama chief leader, pues la persona que está, tiene la responsabilidad mayor en durante una guardia, es decir, díganle hola o levanten la mano. Ella, digamos, ella es, por así decirlo, la jefa de todos los demás, pues. Si yo me encargo de un sistema, yo tengo que reportarme con ella para saber que todo está funcionando en armonía, todos los detectores, todos los sistemas. Ok, Isabel. Ok, so let's walk to the door. Maybe I can show you. You want to write down? Ok. We need also to let the technical shifter know. <laughs> uh -huh. So since it's night here, actually the door to go down is uh, closed. 
because we don't okay. expect any work downstairs. So we have to open it now. So you're waiting for permission or what? Uh, yeah, no, it's fine. We opened the door. You can translate if you want. <laughs> Ok, todo aquí está controlado por seguridad, o sea, cada, cada puerta que se abre, cada eh, acceso a un área tiene que estar controlado por, por, por seguridad, obviamente, por evitar unos accidentes, porque las áreas están restringidas a expertos. De hecho, los guías tienen que tomar un curso especializado para poder hacer este tipo de trabajo, para ingresar a ciertas áreas. Isabel, can, can you tell us a bit more? Yes, so now uh, to go in, I will uh, need to badge with my dosimeter, which I take downstairs. It measures how much uh, radiation we receive. We don't expect anything, but uh, we always take this downstairs and then we have an eye scanner. So I will go through the door and to the elevator. And then while we go down, I think Maki will Ese, entertain el, you. Ella está tomando, se le llama dosímetro, y es algo que tienen que tener para medir los niveles de radiación. En este momento no se espera que tenga ninguna eh, medición porque no está en funciones el, el aparato. Pero aún así, cuando acaba de funcionar el experimento, queda radiación remanente. Entonces, siempre es importante tener ese aparato. Es obligatorio cada, cada persona que baja al experimento para medir los niveles de radiación. Watch ahora... that there is a heart on the door. You see this heart? Ah, yeah. Uh, it's corazón. there because you are not supposed to enter when the magnet is on, because there is field all over in the cavern and in the rooms close to the cavern, if you are having a uh, significant uh, uh, medical implants like pacemakers or whatever that can be hindered. Okay. If you have a pasos y está el campo magnético, no puedes ingresar al área. Te va a hacer interferir, no, básicamente. Entonces por eso tenía ese corazón la signo. Puede dañar el marcapaso, sí. Es un campo magnético que es intenso, sí. Que en It no... is a... Sí. It's okay. a very intense magnetic field, which yeah. even if you are, because you know sometimes you can be at the balconies here. This is called the balconies, and sometimes you, if you are a very absent-minded or whatever running physicist, you the magnet can be starting and you can still be doing things uh, in there and really, really you make sure that you have no tools that can fill the magnetic field because it's extremely strong. But inside this area, of course, we nobody can enter inside this area. It's extremely strong. However, Isabel or uh, Noemi will show you the effect of the magnetic field even after more than 10 meters of concrete, and I don't know how many meters. So we, we I mean, one of the reasons that we uh, have uh, electronics sometimes failing far away from the magnet is exactly the fringe magnetic field, which is not making our electronics happy. It's one of the difficulties of building an efficient uh, detector. It's the detector environment. Do not think only of radiation because against radiation, there is lots and lots and lots of protection. And in practice, there is also lots and lots and lots of material. We are not going to put anything in here, but there is the magnetic field that is against us pretty strongly. Se pueden ver, eh, ahí está descendiendo por el lado. Se pueden ver la, los metros ¿no? que, está, que está descendiendo. Lo que está diciendo es que aparte de la radiación, otra cosa a considerar, en el experimento es el campo, el campo magnético que es muy intenso y se supone que está contenido en el experimento en sí, pero el efecto llega incluso a los balcones son como los corredores que están a los lados del experimento, por acá y por acá, y aún ahí se puede sentir el efecto del campo magnético. I do not know again, ah, sorry, I do not know if uh, you will be seeing again the detector here. I want to show you that this line, me, I am a hundred. Yes, he will show you the picture, Zoltan. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, so me, I am a hundred meters, more than a hundred meters on top of the detector. The platform I am on can move so that heavy objects can be lifted and uh, they can descend down in the cavern. However, what they have 
here, uh, what you can see here in this line is exactly the beam line that enters the heart of the detector. So in practice, I sit on top of the beam. Ella Andromaki está en la superficie, está a 100 metros arriba del detector. De aquí se puede ver básicamente pues eh, el lugar por donde ellos pueden, básicamente los detectores fueron, algunas partes fueron ensambladas afuera y hay eh, digamos un orificio grande donde ellos bajan cada parte del detector y abajo lo pueden armar. Entonces son 100 metros de diferencia de profundidad entre la superficie y ahorita donde se encuentra, se encuentra Isabel. Básicamente. Todo lo, la electrónica, mucha de la electrónica se encuentra en estos cuartos. Entonces no podemos entrar donde está el detector debido a que pues, está cubriendo el LHC, pero podemos ver muchos de los módulos que tienen que dar voltaje, que tienen que dar este, toda la alimentación para los diferentes detectores. Ahí estamos uh, escuchando a nuestras colegas de Puebla. Están, de hecho, en Puebla está haciendo un evento parecido a este, donde hay estudiantes también. Pues ese cuarto donde se encuentra, digamos, el cuarto de procesamiento, cada detector tiene un sistema, ¿no? De, de colección de datos y procesamiento. Y todos los cables que ven aquí tienen un sentido, porque cada uno de esos detectores envía señales hacia estos centros de procesamiento. Son los aparatos que controlan la, el funcionamiento del detector. Entonces pueden ver que hay muchísimos de ellos, obvio porque tenemos un detector gigantesco, tenemos, está equipado con muchos eh, conexiones, muchos cables, cada uno de ellos transporta información hacia estos elementos, hacia estas, hacia estas máquinas, y, y básicamente de aquí se, es el primer lugar donde se procesa la información que se está recolectando. Eh, Isabel, do you want to say something else? Yes, so in the meantime, we have arrived in the service cavern, so you have seen maybe already there's a lot of racks. So this is one which contains power for a part of the detector. It's red, so this means this is high voltage. Uh, so it's red, so you know it's, uh, it can be dangerous and the doors are closed. So I'll walk through a few other of these nice blue racks and uh, tell you what is inside. Esto es lo que provee la so energía you... de los detectores. Son altos voltajes también, entonces eh, hay que manejar con, con cuidado todo esto. De hecho, consume bastante energía el experimento en sí. Eh, eh, pareciera que no, pero es una consideración a tomar en cuenta al momento de operar estas máquinas que es una con, consumen muchísima energía. Uh, yes, Isabel. Yes, so this is a part that visitors cannot see between the racks. Usually we stay outside. Uh, we don't want anyone to bump into cables. So you can see here some racks with orange stripes, which means they will not go off when there is a power cut uh, because there are some systems that are important for the safety of the detector and the people. We That's also don't want them on. to see the mess of the cables, really. We want them to see the mess of the cable. We don't yes. want them. I mean, look at that. No, we don't. <laughs> <laughs> look at that. <laughs> Pareciera que es un desorden, pero cada uno de ellos tiene su conexión correcta. Pues, aunque lo veamos. Yeah, that's, that's the beauty. Esa es la belleza de los experimentos. That's the beauty of the experimental part. That even looks really messy, muy desordenado, pero todo tiene un propósito, ¿no? Que sí funciona. Okay. Okay, so next to. Um... The power systems, we also have a lot of fibers to read out all the data from the detector. For example, in these traits, all these fibers are coming from the detector into these electronic boards to uh, read out all the information that we saw in the detector. <clears throat> Estos son eh, los cables que están leyendo la información del detector. Obviamente tenemos electrónicos en el detector, pero tenemos estos otros electrónicos que nos ayudan a recibir la información. Y de, es, de hecho, esto también se va, por ejemplo, 
mucho de ello al cuarto de control para verificar que las cosas están funcionando también correctamente y luego también se van a otras este, a otros discos en el CERN y alrededor del mundo que se llaman CIRS, que es donde nosotros también vamos a, a colectar y a guardar este, esta información que estamos recibiendo desde el sector. Uh, so one of the systems we have down here is also very important. It's called the trigger. And this system decides if um, the image that we saw after a collision is important or not, because we cannot keep all the data. So um, yeah, these electronics are also in one of these racks and will decide for every event if uh, it is being kept or not, and will then uh, tell the rest of the detector to read out the data or not. Estos dispositivos son los que se encargan del sistema de trigger, es el sistema de disparo, es decir, seleccionar qué eventos más son importantes para, para almacenar, ¿no? Eso obviamente es una lógica eh, compleja porque recaba las señales de muchos detectores y por medio de un algoritmo es capaz de decidir qué evento es interesante y qué evento debemos de rechazar. Y siempre está funcionando cuando estamos por el experimento. Eh, ya. Yeah. So now we can go down a few steps more towards an entrance to the uh, experimental cavern, which is where the experiment is. And uh, you will see, unfortunately, we cannot go through the door. No podemos entrar, obviamente, ahora, porque pues, es peligroso por la radiación y cuando el EHC funciona, ya no, o sea, hay, hay un sistema de seguridad que nos permite que nadie entre, pero por lo menos nos da señal la puerta por donde, donde podríamos entrar a la cabeza. Sí, está corriendo el experimento, es por eso es que no puede ingresar al, al experimento en sí en este momento, pero esta es la puerta justo antes de entrar al, al detector. Isabel. Yeah, so this is the door, um, similar to the one upstairs. Again, you can go through with an eye scanner, but you see no entry. Uh, it's closed because of radiation, yeah, the, since the accelerator is on. So nobody can enter. And you can also see here again, the sign of the magnetic field, which is on. <laughs> Okay, so for the magnetic field, actually, you can also feel it here. You can see these paper clips here hanging. They are not falling down straight because of the magnetic field. They are pulled towards the wall. Y recuerden que todavía estamos lejos ¿eh? de, de, del imán, o sea, del experimento, pero aún así podemos sentir los efectos ¿no? de, del campo magnético. Eh, de ahí todavía, o sea, uno entra en la caverna y debemos estar, y sabemos puede decir tal vez mejor, pero cuando... Cuando muy poco debemos estar por lo menos a unos 10, 15 metros todavía para llegar a donde está el efecto. Y aún así podemos ver el efecto, ¿no? Ah, what do you want to do? Ah. So, yeah, so. So I, I see that the, they are saying that if there is question, you can perhaps answer here. Sure, yes, go ahead. Are there questions? Preguntas. Como pueden ver, el clip está bailando sobre el teléfono, no se orienta hacia donde está el campo magnético, como pueden ver, o sea, ella lo pone de un una dirección, sale volando o regresa. Uh, Isabel, how, how, how far are we from the magnet from where you are, more or less? Sorry, I, I did not hear the question in English. Yeah, sorry. Uh, how far are you from the magnetic, from the um, magnet? 
So where you are, how far is it? Okay, we are still very far. Actually, this here is a very thick wall, several meters before, seven meters before we can enter the cavern. Uh, I, I don't know if you can see this. Ah. Yeah, so there behind the corner, you still have to walk for seven meters and open the door. And then you still are far away because there is the whole muon system um, around. So you see all this red once you're in the cavern. This is still the muon system. And then Maki showed you the magnetis inside um, around the calorimeters. Isabel, we have some questions here in Sonora. Uh, yes, yes, in Puebla we have some as well. So uh, you can go ahead, uh, uh, Alfredo, and then we'll go. Okay, okay, I, I will. Okay. Uh, see, Adla? Hello. Um, my question is why is a CERN underground? Uh, why is CERN underground? Yes. Yeah. So, well, CERN is not really underground. There is a lot of parts of CERN which is above ground, but the largest uh, accelerator, the LHC, is underground because it is so large. And um, to build it above the ground, um, you would have to, um, yeah, it would cost a lot more money and maybe would cr cross places where people already live. So it's a lot easier and cheaper to just uh, build a tunnel underground. El, el CERN en sí está compuesto también de oficinas, es decir, eso está en la superficie, el, el, el laboratorio. El túnel, el acelerador es el que está bajo tierra. Y básicamente es por su, por su longitud, también para no distorsionar, digamos, la vida de los habitantes de la ciudad donde están. También creo que vale la pena comentar, además de que sería prohibitivamente caro, obviamente, poner este gran acelerador en la superficie, por lo que ya comentaron. También es importante decir que nosotros tenemos eh, radiación, ¿verdad?, de, de, de los rayos cósmicos, etcétera, y poniendo nuestros detectores 100 metros bajo tierra, pues reducimos también todo este ruido, ¿verdad?, que no estamos interesados en medir en nuestros detectores, estamos interesados en medir las colisiones. Entonces, con todas estas capas de tierra, pues limpiamos. Cierto. Aunque todavía puede haber Sorry, what? Ah, okay, again. The smartphone, uh, which you are recording, does not feel the magnetic field right now. Ah, th so you are talking about uh, the recording and the magnetic field? Yeah, so he wants recording. To know, yeah, he wants to know if the, if the uh, phone or the camera is not affected by the magnetic field. Yeah, field. so we are yeah. filming with a cam uh, with a phone and uh, it's working fine. I think it depends on the phone model because with my own phone, I have more problems in the experimental cavern here. The field is lower, so I think it's uh, less of a problem. Uh, the only problem I have experienced is the screen uh, keeps turning off. That's, I think, the only problem uh, phones show and it depends on which brand. <laughs> I, I don't know which one is better. <laughs> Bueno, creo que todos entendieron. Dice que depende de la marca, ¿no? Y que, bueno, ahí en la parte donde está, parece que está funcionando bien. El de ella, de hecho, tiene... ¿Otra pregunta? ¿Qué pregunta, sí. maestra? It's credit cards that you are always advised not to take close to that. The rest uh, survive, sort of. But credit cards, you are uh, really strongly consulted to live up. Yeah, credit cards and also watches. Okay, I still have mine on and it's working fine, but in the cavern where the uh, magnetic field is larger, actually my watch just stops turning. So it's not so good for your watch. And exactly. So if you, 
Right. If you enter in the cavern, obviously, uh, you need to be very careful with the magnetic zone, obviously, because anything that is metal would be attracted, right? Perdón, si entras a la cabeza, este, pues hay que tener cuidado con llevar metales, incluso herramientas, no puede ser muy peligroso, uno no puede, si el campo está activado, tienes un desarmador por ahí o algo que puede convertir en un arma, no sale volando, va a ser caído por el, por el campo magnético, entonces hay que, hay que tener mucho cuidado ¿no? con este tipo de cosas, y ya estaban hablando de las tarjetas de crédito también. Recuerden ustedes que la información en las tarjetas de crédito pues está orientada, ¿verdad? Con, de manera, con dipolos. Entonces, si ustedes ponen un campo magnético ni siquiera muy grande, de hecho, en una tarjeta de, 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 del banco, puede ser que ya no les funcione. ¿Por qué? Pues porque ustedes están realineando de otra forma, ¿verdad? La información que tiene ahí puede ser que ya no funcione. Y entonces hay que tener también mucho cuidado con eso. Y había otra pregunta más, ¿verdad? And my other question is, the magnetic field of the earth, uh, those affect the experiment? Uh, he wants to know if the, if the magnetic field affects the experiment of the earth. Affects what, sorry? The experiment. If the magnetic field of the earth, of the planet, affects the, the experiment in some way. Yeah, so while well, the magnetic field is needed for the experiment because it's uh, bending the particles, so it allows us to determine their speed um, and their uh, charge. Yeah, no, he's talking about the magnetic field of the planet, of the air. As long well, as it's uh, constant, uh, it doesn't affect us, but when it changes, yes. And we measure also, it. the Zoltan here. And also the Earth's magnetic field is uh, 100,000 times uh, weaker than the, the, the magnetic field of the experiment. So the effect is extremely low, indeed. Okay, yeah, sorry, I did not understand the question. So one more thing I wanted to say is, this is what uh, the LHC tunnel looks like, the accelerator. Uh, of course, we don't go there um, in reality, I can show you the door that leads there, but it should stay closed because if we open it, automatically the accelerator will shut down because it's dangerous. So this is the, the red door that leads to the accelerator. We have a question here in Sonora. Yeah, uh, yes. Uh, sí, la pregunta. Hi, first of all, thank you for inviting us. And, and I'm really excited I am the teacher. And in order to put a context for the high school students, can you explain if there is a kind of geographical reason to locate CERN in that place of Earth instead of North Pole, South Pole, or any other part? So, well, CERN uh, started already in... Uh, 54. So back then it was built uh, here on the border with Switzerland uh, to um, start research um, with uh, scientists from all over the world uh, in peace after the war. And um, yeah, I'm not entirely sure why they chose this place exactly. I think also because it was close to Switzerland. And um, yeah, it started with small accelerators, which were just built on the surface. And then uh, from there, they build a larger and larger complex still in the same place because we still use the old smaller accelerators first to accelerate the particles uh, in a first step. And then we go to higher and higher energies in different steps uh, until we reach the LHC, which um, uh, um, accelerates the particle to the maximum energy we can do uh, so far. No, no hay razón. Simplemente surgió después de la Segunda Guerra Mundial. Suiza era una buena elección, digamos, para construirlo. No estaba este acelerador que está ahorita, estaban otros tipos de experimentos. Y de ahí fue pues, evolucionando y se tomaron piezas de anteriores experimentos. Ya tenía, el, había otro experimento más pequeño, un acelerador igual, circular, pero más pequeño. Entonces, ese se utilizó para este más grande como una etapa anterior de aceleración de partículas. Entonces ya tenemos este más grande, pero no hay una razón en, en particular. Okay. Uh, 
This got started as a European collaboration in 54. Europe was barely a little bit out of being smoking ruins. We can get back to it. However, at that time you had the US, which was a very strong uh, uh, scientifically community that, that had uh, very well gone through the war. And you had the then Soviet Union with its own accelerators and uh, uh, scientific. So Europe put all its forces together and they did not. I mean, these people at that time had a big vision because it was a very difficult period. So they, they put their forces together because you need a lot of resources in order to build high energy physics labs. And they put their resources in a neutral European country because Europe had just come out of a war where approximately everybody had killed everybody else. So the ideal place to start the, reco the recovery was Switzerland. On top of that, Switzerland was a developed country with a very good system of infrastructures and the seat of many international organizations. So you had all the conditions, but you have to see that in the beginning, it was a very nice lab that was putting certain European powers together. Then we started, uh, I mean, the whole system evolved. And right now we can very, very proudly say that you are going to have to search very hard in order not to find a particular nationality in at CERN, even if not as a state member, but as a collaborating physicist or whatever. So it started small and it started practically just after the war. A terrible one. Uh, Alfredo, ¿quieres traducir o lo hago yo? Porque tenemos otra pregunta aquí. Adelante. Uh, 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 solo para resumir, ella está hablando de lo que ya dijeron, fue después de la Segunda eh, Guerra Mundial, Europa estaba dividida. Entonces, un grupo de científicos visionarios, básicamente, que creyeron que hacer algo científico de gran envergadura, Eh, podría ayudar, digamos, en este, en este periodo de transición a, a, digamos, a la paz, ¿no? Que involucraron muchos países y todo. Suiza, obviamente, siempre se ha declarado un país neutral, entonces esta era una, una buena idea, ponerlo en Suiza, ¿verdad? Pero son de muchos los países europeos, de hecho, que participan aquí, ahora hay 23 países que, que son miembros de, del plan. Y claro, hay más de 60 países asociados, ¿no? Que, que ayudan en estos experimentos, incluyendo México. Ah, Tenemos otra pregunta más. Sí, el Adelante. Ya, we have two questions. Yes. My students want to know if you can have a feel if, if you can feel something in your body when the experiment is running and you are down there, like, I don't know, kind of breathe, um, how can I say, um, breathe, um, a little bit like, yeah, yeah, breathe, or, and also a, if a compass works in, in, in that place, and what kind of devices are you able to use or not? For instance, can I have braces? Can I wear braces, brackets? I don't know how you call it. Braces? If you, you yeah. that, that was the question. No, I think that unfortunately, many, most of us are not at the age of, for wearing braces, but I don't think we have problems, dental problems. So this you can wear, you can even wear jewelry, but as I said, you are going quite far away from the magnetic field. You are never in the room where the magnetic field is switched on. This in principle is forbidden. So where Isabel was, she was after 10 meters of concrete, plus some meters of air, plus another detector. And still, it is not very advisable to bring your credit cards there. Now, if you were there with a compass, no, because it, there is another magnetic field, I mean, uh, it is also very big, our experimental area, but you don't need a compass to, to find your way through that. There are signs. However, anything that gets, uh, anything magnetic is endangered. This is for sure. Uh, but uh, not to the level, not to be able to wear your braces. And what about if you feel something different? In no, body? absolutely not. No pressure? Nothing. No, 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 no. Actually, when you go down with the elevator, Sometimes if you have 
very low blood pressure, uh, then sometimes you feel an effect, but it is a pressure because you are doing 100 meters quite fast, and then you readjust, but you don't feel anything really. No, you don't feel any difference, no. Except it's very pleasant because in the summer it has sta stable temperature. That's nice. Uh, we have actually two questions from Puebla, so I'm going to give the mic uh, to my student. Uh, yes, my first question was, why do you have to wear a helmet? Why do we have to wear a helmet? Why? What was the question? I didn't hear. We didn't yes, hear. Yes, uh, yes. Why? Exactly. Why do you have to wear a, a helmet going down? Okay, uh, we here where we are, we belong to an international organization that has uh, is in principle on Swiss soil, but right now we are also on French soil because, as you saw, most of the accelerator part and the detectors are on French territory. So we are subjected to uh, the, the laws that govern industrial sites in France. And there we all not only have to wear uh, the helmet, we also ha have to wear the most elegant shoes that you can imagine. Show the shoes and they will die of envy, everybody here. Show our shoes because they have to have reinforcement of steel. This is useful because many times you can have objects uh, that you hit. And to tell you the truth, if you are working in the cavern and uh, a little a nail or something very light falls on you from somebody else who is working 25 meters on top of you, then you are very happy that you are wearing the helmet. So it has practical reasons, but also it has uh, legislation reasons because we are in an industrial site. That's why when you will, we hope at some time visit CERN, we have to tell you, you have to always wear closed shoes and no heels. This is the first thing. So yeah. coming back to the magnet, the only thing you feel downstairs is, of course, the steel tip of your shoes that uh, stick to all the uh, steel parts there. <laughs> El, el casco de seguridad, también los zapatos de seguridad, porque vas a un lugar donde hay muchas herramientas, alguien podría estar trabajando, si algo se cae de una forma intimidante, pues podría golpearte la cabeza, los pies. También hay muchas escaleras, hay mucho, mucho equipo por donde tienes que pasar, todo el principio debe de tener la máxima seguridad posible, pero por regulaciones y, y dentro del ser también los países donde se encuentra el ser, hay que usar todos estos equipos. Thank you. My second question is how much time or how many hours do you experiment running in average? Uh, I don't know if you if you heard the question, but uh, completely. yeah, he wants to know uh, for how long the experiment uh, runs in average. So actually it's uh, the accelerator first that has to be ready and run. So we just had a long shutdown, which means for a few years, we did not have any collisions because we had a lot of maintenance and upgrade both on the accelerator and the detector the experiments um, but now that it's running uh, it's basically 24 7 that we have collisions uh, of course uh, once the protons are injected and, and keep colliding we lose protons and at some point uh, we stop this um, fill we call it and we refill the accelerator with new protons so this cycle takes about two hours but then uh, 
the accelerator continues again. And during this whole period, the experiment is ready and taking uh, data. So recording events that are of interest. Then uh, actually every year we also have a, a, sh a shorter shutdown uh, during the winter break, um, also for uh, some maintenance. Um, sorry, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say we run like this for a few years and then we have the major shutdown again as we had recently. Entonces, el LHC, como tú puedas imaginarte, es complicado a veces tener estos, estos protones corriendo los 27 kilómetros de circunferencia del anillo y hacerlos condicionar. De vez en cuando nosotros perdemos el A y entonces pues, se, se, se para la corrida si no estás teniendo más colisiones en los, en los, en los experimentos. Entonces, toma normalmente alrededor de otras dos horas preparar todo, recuperar el ar y todo, y volver a inyectar esos, esos eh, protones en el, en el LHC para que se produzcan nuevamente las condiciones. Entonces, muchas veces, el, lo largo de una corrida depende muchas veces del LHC. Otras veces, claro, podría ser el resto de esto mismo, si la persona tuviera un problema muy grave o algo y no puede tomar datos, pero normalmente tenemos más que nada del LHC. Hay algunas paradas técnicas, por ejemplo, en diciembre, cuando la gente se va de vacaciones, se detiene en el ATC para que la gente pueda ir en diciembre a visitar a sus familias. Y luego también hay algunas paradas técnicas que están bien especificadas en los calendarios para que se puedan hacer mejoras de los detectores, mejoras de la ATC, etc. Entonces es una combinación de todas estas cosas, pero normalmente se corre pues, por, por algunos años y luego se hacen estas paradas técnicas. Y no, 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 o sea, es, es, algunas corridas pueden ser bastante largas. Thank you. This is not a cheap machine, so we hope to keep it with our uh, uh, breaks, as Isabel explained to you, running as it is till, I suppose, 2028, right? And then we stop, and then there is going to be a major overhaul in the accelerator because the accelerator is what provides the pictures to us and we will the accelerator is undergoing major upgrades in order to give us more uh, colliding particles so, so we can take more pictures and have higher statistics for our physics but these type of scientific devices are there for tens of years and sometimes you will be surprised because you can see the most modern technology with something that was built 30 years ago, which is still functioning. So we hope to keep it for a long time. Como en el LHC, porque nos estamos preparando para la fase que se llama la fase de alta luminosidad del LHC, donde esperamos correr el derecho al, al, este, a la energía de diseño del acelerador, que son 14 test, y tener una luminosidad, obviamente, más alta. Ya, yeah, thank you. I, I had a we have a question here from one student. Uh, well, I, I already made the translation. He's asking what will happen if something is missing when the experiment is running. So I assume that uh, he meant that like if somebody forgot something and then the experiment was running there in the cover. You mean forgot something, some equipment there or, or forgot to plug in a cable? <laughs> Nobody can stay in the cover, be sure, because you are always counted. And before you close the area, there is a, a general sweep that uh, takes patrols and patrols of people. So I, I don't think that we can miss somebody for that. But siempre hay una revisión exhausta cuando van a empezar a funcionar para asegurarse de que todo esté completo. E incluso hay sistemas de protección que si algo está faltando, pues te va a impedir empezar el ciclo, digamos. El ciclo. Ok, 
And if you forget to plug in a cable, and hopefully you see it before we actually get collisions, we do turn on the experiment before the LHC is ready. Then we use uh, particles which come um, uh, from cosmic rays. And uh, if you forget to plug in a cable, hopefully we notice something is wrong. Sí, si, si tú olvidas algo, un cable, lo que sea, hay forma de saber antes de iniciar una corrida de que algo no está completamente funcionando. Justamente okay. uno se ayuda con los, con los rayos únicos también para hacer algunas pruebas en el detector y detectores también antes de tener producción. Ok. Ah. Uh, ¿Tienes más preguntas? I have, I have one, one more question here in Puebla, please. Thank you. Well, uh, one thing that I think is very important to know is uh, what are we expecting about research and discoveries? What are we expecting to do in CERN in the next months and maybe years? I, I am asking this because um, I'm interested in these areas of study in physics, and I want to know what can I do when I, when I the individual when I will be working on this. Thank you. Okay, so, so. Thank you. 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 So uh, actually, uh, many physicists here already started looking at this data because there's a few um, simple uh, checks or searches that uh, people were ready for and already uh, used a little bit of data we have to look at. Um, and uh, in the coming years, from a detector point of view and, and the accelerator point of view, we will restart next year and uh, gather more data. Uh, and now with this data, a lot of things are being done. Um, there's a lot of uh, physicists here at CERN and at other institutes that use uh, all the data we collect and that um, are looking at processes we already know a lot of things about uh, in the standard model, as we call it. Um, they try to look at this with the uh, best precision they can in order to check uh, if they can find some deviation. Some people like to look for uh, new things that we don't know yet. Uh, this is pretty difficult because we don't know exactly what to look for, but so we look for anything uh, that is doesn't uh, follow the standard model. These are the two main ways of uh, investigating the physics we know and the physics we don't know. Uh, Isabel está diciendo que, bueno, eh, lo, lo primordial ahorita es pues, terminar la corrida que estamos este, comenzando y, claro, terminar de tomar datos este año y luego viene lo demás. Eh, obviamente, en el data dice que hay varias formas, entonces no puede buscar física. Física, por ejemplo, más allá del de modelo estándar, que todavía no conocemos bien, pues a veces no sabemos incluso dónde tenemos que estar buscando, entonces es difícil. Entonces nos vamos apoyando de modelos, ¿verdad? Que a veces predicen que podría haber una nueva partícula, alguna otra cosa, una destrucción. Y entonces se busca, digamos, por ahí, pero la mayor parte de las veces pues no hay ninguna garantía de que vas a encontrar algo. La otra cosa es buscar desviaciones en el modelo estándar. Es decir, de pronto tú sabes que el modelo estándar puede predecir, ¿no? Que es lo que tenemos ahorita, lo mejor que tenemos para explicar el universo en el que vivimos, cómo está la materia, etcétera. Pero a veces nosotros este, lo que nos conviene hacer es tomar medidas cada vez más precisas de todo, de masa, de tiempo de vida, etc. Entonces, algunas veces nosotros podemos estar intentando medir algo muy precisamente y vemos una desviación, es decir, que no coincide exactamente el número con el modelo estándar. Entonces, lo que uno puede hacer es ver si esta desviación es real y podría darse algo de física nueva, interesante, o si de pronto algo en tu análisis no salió bien y entonces esa desviación se puede explicar con algunos de los errores que no estás tomando en cuenta correctamente. Es por eso que es importante también tener no solo un experimento, sino por lo menos otro experimento. En el caso de CMS, normalmente la competencia amigable es Atlas. 
se puede básicamente medir lo que nosotros medimos y entonces si nosotros vemos alguna desviación ahí, pues Atlas podría, por ejemplo, verificar si la desviación es real, porque si él no la mide, pues, pues a lo mejor es un problema con ¿no? Entonces eso pues, también es, es, es interesante. Pero eh, la corrida de la de alta luminosidad eh, después del 2028, pues va a ser muy interesante porque aumentamos la energía, aumentamos la luminosidad, de número de colisiones por área de tiempo, y eso ciertamente ya te da una oportunidad más de encontrar de pronto algo interesante, ¿no? Ajá. Yeah, thank you. ¿Alguien más tiene pregunta? Otra más. Ajá. Alfredo, do you have more questions over there? Questions, preguntas. I think we're fine here. We're done. I think we have one last question here in Puebla, and I think that would be perfect. Thank you. And my question is, how could a theoretical physicist uh, could work at uh, NHC or CERN? Yeah, so how theoretical physicists can go there and work at CERN? A theoretical physicist? Yes. Uh, so if the question is for a theoretical physicist, both Isabel and myself are very far from theoretical physicists. However, <laughs> however, as you see from our shoes, however, the, there is a very nice part of CERN, a very, very nice building, where it's the only offices that are not cluttered and where you only have a blackboard or a whiteboard now and people looking at it. And this is the part of the theoretical physicist. And indeed, we are very proud at CERN to say that we have a very selected group. Usually we have reasonably young theoretical physicists because you see a theoretical physicist is a teacher also, is a professor. A theoretical physicist will not deal with the cables and with the fibers. The theoretical physicist will drive students and be driven by them. So most of the theoretical physicists you will find in the universities, they come at CERN, they interact with us for a couple of years, they interact with the limited size but very selective group of theoretical physicists that are permanently at CERN, but they are our basic part of interacting with the physics community. So it's a camp and it's a goal. They always come as fellows, they have limited time contracts, but CERN as being a lab does not have very many theoretical physicists. However, every year we are very proud to have new ones and keep the communication. So theoretical physicists are extremely welcome at CERN. Okay, uh, so the, lo que está diciendo es que hay un grupo pequeño que sí trabaja para hacer, digamos, de equipos teóricos, que de hecho tienen las oficinas más bonitas en el CERN. Se la remodelaron, porque por ahí fue por donde pasó Higgs y todos ellos cuando le dieron el premio Nobel y ahí anunciaron que se había descubierto Higgs en el auditorio, por ahí pasó toda la prensa y toda la gente y quedaron muy bonitas todas las oficinas que son justamente de los teóricos. Y eh, pero eh, dice que hay muchos profesores teóricos en diferentes países del mundo y universidades que pueden venir a trabajar a CERN, quedarse ahí incluso por estancias de investigación, meses, años, dependiendo de quienes de, 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 digamos, trabajando en estancias. Trabajan con el grupo pequeño, digamos, de teóricos que está dentro de CERN y luego regresan a sus instituciones. Entonces, como ustedes se pueden imaginar, pues el laboratorio más que nada eh, tiene la parte más grande que es la experimental, que es donde se hacen pues, los experimentos, pero a pesar de ello sí hay grupos, digamos, de teóricos, asociados a sean pequeños, pero pueden venir otros profesores que van a interactuar y van a estar un tiempo y luego regresar a sus universidades. Ok, well, thank you very much. I think uh, that's it from here. Uh, we really, really appreciate your help uh, with the virtual visit. I think the students are very happy and it was great to, to be able to see uh, CERN. 
Um, and then uh, again, thank you very much to you and the, uh, Naomi and Sultan and for the, the really nice uh, help. And uh, so I hope you have a nice uh, evening. Thank you. Thank you for visiting. Thank you. And thank you for all the translating. Thank you very much also for Sonora. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> um, <laughs>